The German offensive of the past 10 weeks had erased all of the Russian gains of the war, reinvigorated the Austro-Hungarian army, and put the Russians into full retreat week after week. What more could go wrong for Russia? Well, how about this? This week, Germany launches a new offensive. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, German Southwest Africa unconditionally surrendered the entire colony to South African forces. The Russians had finally halted General Mackensen's colossal force for a while, and had also dealt the Austro-Hungarian Imperial forces a nasty defeat. The British had successfully defended La Haye at the mouth of the Red Sea, while on the Black Sea coast in Trabzon, the Armenian genocide continued. I'm going to start off with some numbers today, since this is going to be kind of a technical episode. The Germans announced that for the month of June, last month, in the Eastern Theater from the Baltic to the Pilica, they'd taken 25,595 Russian prisoners. And in the Southeastern Theater, from the Pilica to Bukovina, 140,650. The Austro-Hungarian general staff reported taking 194,000 prisoners during that same period. So that's a total of 360,000 245 Russian prisoners taken in one month. Of these men, 1,051 were officers. They also took 180 big guns and 684 machine guns. Russia was in big trouble. In fact, on the 16th, in Petrograd, the new Russian Minister of War, Alexei Polivanov, declared at a meeting of the Council of Ministers, I consider it my duty to declare to the Council that the country is in danger. Where our retreat will end, only God knows. I want to look at the disposition of the Russian troops now, since we haven't really done that and it might get confusing at times. They look like this. The Russian 5th Army under General Pleve held the line from Riga to Kovno. The 10th Army under General Radkevich from Kovno to Osovets. The 12th Army, led by General Churin and including Siberian Corps, from Osovets to the Orsitz River. From there, General Livinov held the line down to the lower Vistula River. And from there, the second army under General Smirnov in Warsaw held it to Guru Kalvaria. General Avert, stationed at Ivangorod, held the front with the fourth army from northwest of the city to about 16 kilometers south of Lublin. The third army under General Lesh held it from there to south of Kelm. The 13th army under General Gorbachevsky from there to Vladimir Volinsk. General Brusilov and his 8th Army held the line from northeast of Sokal to west of Solotshiv. The 11th Army under General Sherbachev from there to Nizhniv. And finally, the Russian 9th Army under General Lechitsky from there to Kotin. That is one hell of a front line, and it was going to get messy. This week, on July 14th, a great German offensive designed to go all the way from the Baltic down to Bukovina begins. The Germans move toward Riga, one group toward Kovno, and another towards Chavil. Now, one thing to remember here is that the Austro-German troops further south, who had been fighting the gorlitz tarnov offensive since May 1st and taking huge amounts of territory from the Russians, had been halted last week. They took some time to recuperate and were back in action this week. In the south, the Austrians crossed the Dniester River in Bukovina. Further north, the Russians fell back in Poland towards the Narev River, as on July 15th, the Germans announced the occupation of the city of Chasnitz. Over 20,000 more Russian prisoners were taken in a few days. As for General Mackensen, the man behind Gorlitz at Tarnov, his phalanx was also moving on, taking Krasnostav at the end of the week with 6,370 prisoners. It's amazing the amount of ground the Central Powers had taken or retaken this summer. But if we look further south, to Gallipoli, we see one offensive still going nowhere. There had been plenty of action in June and July at Cape Helles, and this week, British General Aylmer Hunter Weston and his French counterpart Henri Gouraud were going to try again. This time, the British would attack the Akibaba Nola sector, supported by both British and French artillery. Meanwhile, combined French and British troops were going to try to take the Turkish trenches that remained on the western bank of Kerebes Dere. One attack to begin at 7.30 a.m., the other just before 5 p.m. So, the first attack began after a preliminary artillery barrage, and as the French and British secured the first of two lines of Turkish trenches, confusion began to descend. It was because what looked like the third trench line, the final objective, turned out to be only about two feet deep and undiggable, so they eventually had to retire since there was hardly any cover. The second attack still went off as planned, and it followed exactly the same pattern. 
artillery barrage, bloody attack against resistance, confusion when the third trench again turned out not to be a third trench, and then eventually a retreat and a consolidation at the second trench line. The next day saw more attacks and violent counterattacks, and the Turks would take a total of nearly 10,000 casualties, far more than the Allies. But they could easily bring up reserves, so you have to realize that at this rate of taking territory, it would take the Allies years to actually take Akibaba or Kilid Bar, two major goals. Here's Major General Granville Egerton's assessment of the events of July 12th and 13th. The fighting of this battle was premature, and at the actual moment, worse than unnecessary. I submit that it was cruel and wasteful. The troops were tired and worn out. It was well known to the higher command that large reinforcements were arriving from England. Was it not therefore obvious that the exhausted garrison at Hellas should be given a fortnight's respite? If the conception of the battle was wrong, the tactics of the action were worse. The division of the attack was positively wicked. It was, quite simply, a waste of lives. Even General Hunter Weston himself wouldn't be there for much longer, actually. He began to suffer the effects of heat stroke and was evacuated home soon after. He may have had serious flaws as a general, but really, the overall responsibility for the doomed and pointless attacks at Hellas in June and July lay with the man in overall command, General Sir Ian Hamilton. Here's a little side note that tells you what the men thought of the attacks. Twice during July, British forces refused to advance at Gallipoli. But this week, the British had indeed taken two trench lines, but at a cost of thousands of men. That couldn't realistically continue. It was a stalemate. And not the only one, as the endless stalemate of the Western Front continued. Up in Belgium, the Germans attacked on the Isar Canal, taking heavy losses and failing again to capture the left bank. At the other end of the front, Kaiser Wilhelm's son, Crown Prince Wilhelm's forces were again stopped in the Argonne. But a new attack captures the French line at vienne la chateau and the heights of La Ville Morte. And here are a few notes to round out the week. Venice was bombed for the fourth time by Austrian airplanes on the 11th. On the 14th, Montenegrins hold off an Austrian attack at Grahovo. And on the 11th, the Turkish Interior Ministry instructs that depopulated Armenian villages be settled with Muslim immigrants. Also this week, the German government took control of the German coal industry, and in Britain, the National Registration Bill passed the House of Lords. And that was the week. The Germans beginning a new offensive in the north, while they and their allies mercilessly continue an old one in the south. The British, French, and Turks losing thousands of men basically for nothing at Gallipoli. The Belgians holding off the Germans, but the French not faring quite so well. But however bad things were at Gallipoli, they were nothing compared to what was happening to the Russians. I mean, not just losing close to 400,000 troops as prisoners in a month, and that's not the dead or wounded. Russian casualties had topped a million in early 1915. Just the officer losses by the end of 1914 were greater than the number of total officers at the beginning of the war. One source says 50% more. Who was going to replace them? Who was going to lead or inspire the troops? Promotion from within the ranks was often counterproductive since over half the troops were illiterate. Many at home who had the education got deferments. There were even fewer non-commissioned officers. The desperate need for replacement troops meant that loads of new soldiers arrived after two or three weeks of training without weapons. And all of those prisoners being taken by the enemy meant vital equipment being taken by the enemy that was not replaced. Russia had millions of men and almost endless land, but would that be enough? And how many millions of men must be lost before the Germans and Austrians could be stopped? And with Germany launching a new, ambitious offensive, it would only get worse. By this point in the war, we were now looking at death and destruction on a scale never before imagined. But don't get the wrong picture here. The Russians were certainly not incapable of anything. Just in February, the Austrians were afraid the Russians were going to invade their homeland. Who knew that the Russians were better prepared for mountain warfare in winter? You can check out how that went in our episode from week 29 right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Matthew Hartshorn. Thank you, Matthew. If you want to help our show to produce more awesome specials, support us on Patreon. And for a glimpse behind the scenes of our show, you can join our ever-growing Facebook community. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.